They are known as the ambassadors of basketball wherever they go, and they've traveled all over the world playing the sport they enjoy the most. But before every performance, the Harlem Globetrotters mentally and physically prepare for the game backstage. Globetrotter captain Jimmy Blacklock, who turned down a professional career with the NBA, says the fellas don't do anything extraordinarily special before the game because most of the action on the court is always spontaneous and unrehearsed. He says his teammates usually talk about the previous game, get ankles taped, and mingle with their fans. The six-year veteran says the Globetrotters' aim is to entertain as well as win. As you know, Globetrotters is a entertainment, but there's a little competition that goes on between both teams nightly. Uh, the opponent we play, we try to win, you know. For us, losing would be like just like killing Santa Claus, you know. No one wants that to happen. But we try to win each night. But the thing is, we try to show our skills, our basic skills, along with the skills that the Globetrotters has taught us, blend them, to get, blend them together as entertainment for all the people out to see us. Then it's on to the court for an afternoon of entertaining basketball. Kim Davis, WSFA, TV News. Forestry Commission Public Affairs Director Frank Sego says the Shelby County brush fires are still not contained. He blames the high winds for drying out the ground, thus making land like this susceptible to fires. These fires are still burning. In fact, just a few moments ago, I learned that we have about 360 acres still burning in Shelby County. Sego says landowners should take special precautions during a dry spell. I would tell them to be very careful about any outside burning. Be sure that all fires are put out. As we like to say, don't leave anything in the woods or don't leave anything when you're doing any burning except your tracks. Sego says the fires during this dry period aren't nearly as bad as those two years ago. He says a new law, plus improved aerial detection, has helped decrease forest fires in Alabama. We've done that, first of all, through getting the Alabama legislature in its 1980 regular session to pass a burning permit law. And by that, I mean anyone who desires to do any burning outside must first call the Alabama Forestry Commission and get a permit number assigned to them. You're required to call for a permit even if you only want to burn a pile of leaves from your yard. And this dry spell's a good time to obey that law. Jane Matheson, WSFA, TV News. Fishing is my favorite thing. I feel closer to, I don't know, God. I got a crow sitting up there with two other, well, I guess those are baby crows. It's kind of interesting that Christ chose his apostles mostly from among fishermen, you know. And I just feel as if uh, it's the primitive thing. It's almost like a man and wife, you know, mating. It's, it's, as, it's as instinctive as that for me. You're getting it straight from the hand of God out of its natural habitat. Freedom is a luxury of self-discipline, and I think we are there and the way the Romans were. But we have one new thing. We have the spreading of those temptations, which normally come with prosperity, made much more efficient by this medium television, which can get into your homes uh, of, of just about everybody and pervade their lives. I think the television industry simply is not saddled from their point of view with any a particular responsibility. They're not required to be accountable for the use of that power. Rather than begin as a self-appointed uh, witch hunter, as it were, as I'm already uh, painted, but I don't care. I don't believe that's going to sell in Alabama. I don't even think it's going to sell in the United States. I think the people are going to wait and see what I do. But having been painted that way, I would be tempted to let the so-called liberals be the ones who point out that which needs to be done in the way of witch hunting. That's one part. You can't be just, that might be a fish, it might not. Yeah. I think we might have one, boys. I thought I had bottom, but I got a fish. And we'll see what it is. It's not very big, but it ain't, uh-oh, shucks. <laughs> it is bottom. <laughs> Each year, the legislature must pass a budget funding the state's various departments for the coming fiscal year. 
All of the State Departments have already submitted written requests saying how much they would like to get. But when you total all of those requests, they more than exceed the amount of tax dollars that are expected to come in. So it becomes a legislature's responsibility to decide how much, if any, will be cut from each agency so that the state's expenditures don't exceed the revenues that will come in. As in the case of education this past year, the legislature passed a budget larger than taxes could meet, and that resulted in proration. The budget hearing is made up of 20 members of the House and 24 members of the Senate. On Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of the next four weeks, those 44 legislators will give just more than 40 of the state's 200-some-odd agencies an opportunity to argue their financial needs. Also, 11 four-year colleges and the state's junior and technical schools will present their arguments for funding. The hearings do little more than that. Listen to the arguments of the agencies and schools. Then those 44 legislators, most of whom are members of the two houses' finance committees, take those written requests, the verbal arguments, and a governor's budget proposal and combine them into a funding plan for the fiscal year that begins this coming October. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA TV News at the Capitol. Do you solemnly swear that you will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic? That you will bear true faith and allegiance to the same? That you take this obligation freely without any mental reservation of purpose of invasion? That you will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which you are about to enter? So help you God. Thank you. you are now members of the Congress of the United States. The late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday will be observed as a legal holiday next Thursday by Montgomery County employees. The observance day as of now will be for 1981 only. The motion passed 4-1, to one, but not without some discussion. Commissioner John Knight voted against Joel Barfoot's final motion that January 15th of this year be observed as a legal holiday and further observances of King's birthday in future years not be honored. Knight then made a substitute motion to continue to observe Confederate Memorial Day, Robert E. Lee and Jefferson Davis's birthday as required by state law, but then mandating county employees to work on the Saturdays following each holiday. Knight's motion, which he says was based on economic reasons, was turned down by a 3-2 to two vote. Then Commissioner Bill Joseph's motion, tabled at last Monday's meeting to rescind the observance of King's birthday altogether, prompted Knight to address the commission, saying the real reason for not wanting to make January 15th a legal holiday is not economic. Yep. Maybe you should get down to the real issue as to why you don't want to honor Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Forget about all the rhetoric as it relates to economics and trying to save the county money because this issue never came up until such time as a resolution was passed by Montgomery County trying to honor Dr. King, the only black man of this whole list of birthdays that we are honoring, just one out of the entire list. The final vote gives county employees next Thursday off, but leaves the door open for future action by the commission and legislature to decide on whether or not to make Dr. King's birthday a legal holiday in Montgomery County and in Alabama. Kim Davis, WSFA, TV News. Mr. Bergen, is there anything you do differently today?
Governor James told reporters he found the troops in high spirits and their equipment seemed ready and well maintained. How but he says if there were problems in Europe, the U.S. would run out of supplies there within two weeks. So he says he returns to Alabama totally rededicated to maintaining Alabama's 20,000 National Guard troops. It's a matter of building pride. Uh, it's a matter of uh, Alabamians wanting to be in their guard. It's a matter of employers uh, cooperating uh, with summer camp. And uh, it's, it's a matter of taking all of that very seriously, more so than it is appropriations. Governor James says the Pentagon must define the role of the National Guard and training should be a top priority. He says some World War II facilities need to be updated and soldiers in Europe should be better paid. Lisa Nielsen, WSFA TV News. I felt like I was the best choice for the job. I had not been, I had not. <laughs> I, that, um, I also knew, knew that I'd never been unemployed and that, you know, if we didn't get this job that, because I discussed it with my wife Sue and I regret that she's not here because she has a great deal to do with me being here. And uh, I discussed it with Sue and, and uh, we felt like that this was this opportunity may come along once in a lifetime, and uh, I was not in the position to where I would let, um, you know, the administration at, at Wyoming, and, and I have absolutely no regrets at all, and, and uh, I can understand, you know, them being in the position that they were in, but I was not going to let them force me into making a decision that would uh, affect my coaching career the rest of my life. So, uh, no, nope, not a bit. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I uh, to be honest with you, I called Dr. Funderburk and he said, "Pat, it's just like it is. We've made no decision. You still, uh, you know, you still uh, a top candidate, but that's as much as I can tell you." Uh, the state basically the legislature more pertinently will. Since we only grew 4% the first quarter, that uh, rather dismal figure is background or backdrop, I think they say, to uh, again our whole uh, funding predicament that uh, the state especially the legislature more pertinently, will face in the session that's ahead.
McDonald says in light of those first quarter figures, the trust fund would have to grow 17 percent in each of the next three quarters in order to fund school systems the full amount appropriated by the legislature. McDonald says since that's almost impossible, level funding for all components of education is practically assured. In fact, he says mandatory increases in retirement and Social Security costs will claim $70 million off the top of any revenue increases next year. So, he says the legislature must be conservative in budget appropriations. It's not asking a great deal of, uh, of the education community to accept conservative appropriations in the first place because of the, the very handsome increases that educational components have enjoyed over the past six or eight years anyway. McDonald says state government has to do what the average man is doing straining and being conservative to get by. Pleas for conservation began the first day of legislative budget hearings today. Chris Grimshaw at the uh, Capitol. By the trust fund in something more than 10 years. More than 150 persons who were indicted for defrauding the state's welfare system in November returned to the courthouse for a status hearing to determine when or if they'll go to trial. Mostly all will face a court hearing. The trials are set for next month. Most of the defendants are black females charged with falsifying applications for food stamps and aid to dependent children. One recipient admitted she defrauded the welfare system. She says she had a part-time job to support a household of 12, but she knew she wasn't supposed to work. She says she received $118 a month. She says that wasn't enough. Attorneys say their clients aren't guilty of intentionally defrauding the welfare system. Former Governor John Patterson, who represents a welfare recipient, says the state will have a hard time proving many of the cases. Many of these people, possibly even most of them, uh, had no idea uh, as to what the law or the regulations were and probably were not properly told uh, what they were and therefore had no intent uh, to commit a crime. And uh, this is a charge which requires that you uh, specifically intend uh, to mm -hmm. commit a crime. Uh, and the state's going to have a very difficult time in most of these cases proving that, in my, in my opinion. The state must prove that the defendants specifically intended to defraud the system. If found guilty, the defendants could face up to 10 years in prison. Kim Davis, WSFA, TV News. United States, uh, probably I wouldn't swap him for anybody in the world, and Sam Austin. And he and I commiserate over uh, city revenue. So if the, the, the federal revenue sharing uh, in itself, if I think that uh, the American people are basically strong. Revenues are slower this year than they have been. Uh, we're, we're behind the curve, so to speak. I don't think it is anything uh, to be alarmed at, but the storm flags are at least fluttering. And we're taking every look and every precaution based on that. But the revenues are not increasing at the rate that they have been in the past. <laughs> Programs that they do have, though, it is returned and the local government does have a say in how it is spent. So many of these other uh, cut back. Mrs. McDaniel admitted taking $11,000 from Birmingham contractor Howard Buchanan. She says the cash gift was delivered to her by former South Central Bell executive James Mayberry. Buchanan is president of a contracting firm that has a long-standing contract with South Central Bell. In pleading guilty, Mrs. McDaniel admitted taking the money in exchange for her vote in the rate hike case. She says she used the money for campaign expenses. Mrs. McDaniel, seen here during an October court appearance, has already been convicted on another charge of violating the State Ethics Act in the submission of an expense voucher that was already paid by an independent telephone executive. Today, Mrs. McDaniel pleaded guilty to the latest ethics law violation charge, but she refused to call it a bribe. In return, District Attorney One Jimmy Evans Daniel dropped the charge of bribery. Evans says his government. office was ready to go to trial on the bribery charge, the and James Mayberry would have been called as a witness. First. Sentencing date for Mrs. McDaniel is set for February 20th. She could get up to seven years and or a $10,000 fine. Evans says he'll make his sentence recommendation to the court, but he says he's never recommended probation for a public official guilty of violating the law. As for James Mayberry, who was convicted of an ethics violation, 
Evans says the former South Central Bell executive will probably be called on again for testimony, but Evans says he doesn't know what his office will recommend in exchange for that testimony. As for the PSC investigation, Evans says it's ongoing. Gina Gregory, WSFA TV News. Budget Officer Jimmy Rayford addressed the Joint Budget Hearing Committee, updating them on the financial condition of the state, which he said was not all that good. Rayford rehashed the bleak 4% growth of the Education Trust Fund for the committee, then turned toward what he described as a deceptive general fund budget, which grew by 31% during the first quarter of this year. But Rayford was quick to point out that the large increase included the new cigarette and rolling paper tax, which would be a one-time windfall increase. Beyond that, Rayford said there are a number of conditional obligations the state hasn't paid out to mental health, Medicaid, and the prison systems. Rayford says just to meet those obligations would more than eat up that 31% growth. Add to that the federal revenue sharing dollars that won't come in during the next fiscal year. Rayford says overall growth this year won't amount to very much, perhaps 5%. Rayford never explicitly warned the committee to be conservative in their budgeting, but got the message across by describing his shift to conservative pessimism. For several years in a row, the administration's projections have had to be downgraded as the year rolled by and the economy receded, and this year Rayford says he's trying to be careful. Among administrative and legislative officials, it's generally accepted that revenues are not going to improve very much next year. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA-TV News at the Capitol. our percentages <laughs> Tony, uh, what's the, what's the note? <coughs> who's that? Who's that guy? Johnny Majors. Call Johnny Majors. Why don't know what he wants? Uh, I have a slightest idea. I hope it's not tickets. <laughs> <laughs> Do you hear from him often? I don't, I don't get to talk with Coach very much, you know. He, he's quite busy and tied up with, uh, of course, his coaching with University of Tennessee. But I talk to him from time to time. I see him sometimes in the off season. Uh, sometimes I may even talk to a recruit or two for him. Help him a little bit down there at Tennessee, huh? Well, Marlene just is back up at Pittsburgh, of course. But, uh, you know, if, if God wants to talk to me about Johnny Majors as a coach, then I have nothing but good things to say about him. But uh, I would not try to go out and recruit guys for the University of Tennessee because, uh, you know, I'm an alumnus at the University of Pittsburgh. But, uh, you know, if, if me talking to a guy, telling how great a coach he is and great, how great a guy he is, it's going to help a guy go there, then I don't mind doing that. But I would not try to sell the University of Tennessee to a guy.
policeman shot Tony Harrelson two weeks ago when officers were searching the Shadow Lane area for a suspected car thief. Harrelson was holding a rifle inside a vacant house when police spotted him. Police say they warned Harrelson to drop the weapon, but instead he pointed the rifle at them. It was then that Officer David McGilvery fired into the house wounding Harrelson. After the shooting incident, it was determined that Harrelson was not the suspect police were looking for. As is customary, the district attorney's office investigated the case and presented the evidence to the grand jury. Mayor Falmer told the council the grand jury found no evidence of criminal misconduct on Officer McGilvery's part. Councilman Donald Watkins asked the mayor if a financial claim had been filed with the clerk by Harrelson or his family. Mayor Farmer says there hasn't been at this point, and he says the city is taking care of Harrelson's hospital bills. When Watkins asked where that money comes from, the mayor says it comes out of a claims fund outlined in the city's budget. In other action, the council voted to grant an architectural easement for the preservation and restoration of the old train shed behind Union Station. Cassandra Taylor, WSFA TV News. The opinion one of 11 acted on by the Ethics Commission during its first meeting of the calendar year says Commissioner Cooper, although not in conflict of interest, is restricted from taking part in rent subsidy payments to eligible recipients if it goes through his department and if the welfare agency controls eligibility. The commission says pensions and security must not be a referral point for recipients of homes constructed by Cooper's business. In another opinion, the commission says a Gulf Shores councilman should remove himself from any complex city action in the purchase of property through his realty firm. Executive Director Melvin Cooper says a continuing problem for his staff is deciding if a conflict of interest exists if public officials accept free transportation from private enterprise. The commission ruling on such a request says there is no conflict of interest when municipal officials accept free aircraft transportation within the state from a private firm if, according to the opinion, no understanding exists between the two and would influence a vote official action or the judgment of the municipal officials. George Mitchell, WSFA TV News. This is the welfare hotline where calls reporting suspected fraud come in. There are six bureaus hooked into these lines, food stamps, public assistance, family and children's services, adult services, special programs, and unemployment compensation. Once the call comes in, it's then transferred to the agency where the abuse is reported, where they in turn write up reports on the calls. Welfare hotline. Pensions and Security Commissioner Gary Cooper instituted the hotline because of the number of complaints he received about abuses in the various programs. Before, the only way to report suspected fraud was to call or write the local agencies. Now the hotline provides one central number for reporting abuse. When the calls come in, they're transmitted to counties involved. Each case is investigated on the local level, and the counties then file a report with the PNS office. If fraud is found, the case is turned over to the Attorney General's office. PNS officials say it's still too early to tell just how successful the hotline will be. They say most of the calls are on food stamp abuse, but few cases of actual fraud have been discovered. If you suspect fraud, the hotline number is 1-800-392-8048. Gina Gregory, WSFA TV News. We in the Youth Aid Division of the Montgomery Police Department want to thank the citizens. This year was the most successful one of the three years I would have been associated with the Youth Aid Needy Family Christmas Program. Uh, I'd like to say, say along with uh, the Major and Corporal Bailey that without the people and the merchants here in Montgomery, this would not be possible. Uh, the more uh, stuff that's donated, the more people, needy people in Montgomery that we can provide uh, Christmas for. 
Alabama State University officials haven't received an official copy of the report yet and say they aren't prepared to make any official comment. But they say they're not surprised at the report's comments on substantial duplication of bachelor's and master's degree programs at ASU, Auburn University, and Troy State University in Montgomery. The university says, however, that the duplication of programs offered at all three Montgomery institutions could have been eliminated had the Alabama Commission on Higher Education gone along with their 1980 proposed tri-institution merger. University officials say they'll make an official comment after receiving a copy of the full report. Kim Davis, WSFA, TV News. Braddock made the remarks concerning Britain and the Board of Corrections to a Mobile Citizens group called March Against Crime. Braddock says the state has one of the largest work release programs in the country, and the only way the program will work is if the classification of work release inmates is done correctly. I have asked Mr. Britain one month ago to send me a list of every individual that has been placed on work release over the past 12 months tell me what they're in, incarcerated for and give me any criminal history that individual might have. Today, I have received nothing. I only hope that Mr. Britton, when he received that request, smelled that the Attorney General was getting ready to assault the correctional system and he's out there jerking everybody in that he knows are murderers, rapists, robbers, and people who sell dope to our children. Braddock says he will sue Britain if he doesn't receive the list of work release prisoners. In the meantime, Britain says he plans to meet with Graddock as soon as the Attorney General returns from Mobile. Jane Matheson, WSFA, TV News. The Department of Mental Health is under a court order to reform, and the $85 million bond issue is designed to meet renovation and construction costs needed to meet that court order. Finance Director Sid McDonnell asked the committee to recommend a special session during the last week of January to specifically deal with the legislation needed to create an authority to handle the sale of the bonds. McDonnell says he's worried about legislators holding the bond legislation hostage as leverage for passage of other bills. And he also says February now looks like the best time to sell the bonds. For months, there has been speculation that Governor James might just call such a special session, but has held off because the idea is seemingly unpopular. Another Oversight Committee member, Senator Sonny Callahan, said although he agrees that the bond issue is a matter of top priority, he doesn't like the idea of a special session and has been given similar sentiment from other senators. Callahan suggested running it through the first week of the regular session and take the chance that a lawmaker might try to use a filibuster on the bill to his advantage. It was emphasized that the bond issue would not only help the state comply with the mental health reform order, but would also qualify the state for three to one federal matching dollars that would not only help the state pay off the debt of the bond, but pump as much as $20 million a year into the state. More details on the specifics of the bond legislation and a decision on whether to recommend a special session are expected next week. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA TV News at the Capitol. Bronner says based on the current formula, the state will have to pay $200 million to the teacher's retirement system, $49 million to employees, and $4.5 million to judges next year. But Bronner also gave lower figures based on actuaries' reports that the state is paying a higher percentage of teachers' retirement needs than necessary. That's because the fund's investment returns have been unusually high. House Speaker Joe McCorkadale asked Bronner why the state is still paying the high percentage. Bronner replied that the Retirement Systems Board wants the legislature to pass a bill lowering the percentage and appropriating the extra money for more benefits. Representative Lee Pegues says he's worried about slowing down escalating retirement costs. And Representative Bob McKee says at the current rate, one day there's not going to be enough revenue in the whole state to fund retirement systems alone. Another mandatory expense in the state's budget is Social Security. Director Ben Swindle says the state must pay more than $100 million to that fund next year. That's assuming no one gets a pay raise. Last year, the state underestimated Social Security costs because Swindle forgot to figure them into his budget request. This year, Swindle has given the state two figures, one including a 7.5% pay raise and one without. Lisa Nielsen, WSFA TV News. The report is the culmination of a statewide review of higher education which was conducted in 1978. The Office for Civil Rights within the Department of HEW did the review to see if the state schools are in compliance with Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Title VI provides that no one should be discriminated against because of race, color, or national origin 
under any program that gets federal assistance. The report says the state of Alabama is in violation of Title VI because it has failed to eliminate the idea of a dual system of education for blacks and whites. It says black students continue to concentrate in traditionally black institutions, the same as whites in traditionally white schools. The report calls for a statewide workable plan aimed at fighting desegregation in the areas of admission, recruitment, and retention of students, student placement, and the duplication of program offerings among institutions, the role and the enhancement of black schools, and changes in the racial composition of the faculty. HEW says it's not and enough to maintain a non-discriminatory admissions the, uh, policy if the students continue to racially identify with the institution. On the subject of duplication, HEW says there's a problem in the Montgomery area among Alabama State University, okay. Troy State Montgomery, and Auburn University at Montgomery. I don't know, but it just seems to me to be economically wise, perhaps, or unwise, if we have two independent universities in the same city. And then the, the same thing would happen in Huntsville, the University of Huntsville. I think that's a thought that we need to, uh, need to think about. The report gives the governor 60 days to come up with a statewide plan and 60 days to evaluate that plan. At the end of the 120-day period, the department will then either accept the plan or possibly initiate enforcement proceedings. Governor James says he hasn't read the report, but says he will respond accordingly if the findings are valid. Cassandra Taylor, WSFA TV News. Athens State has been a thorn in AUM's side for three years. Coach Larry Chapman and the Senators are 0-6 against the visitors from North Alabama. And Chapman isn't forecasting an easy time of it tomorrow night, even though AUM is off to its best start ever at 11-1. He insists Athens State is a much improved club from a year ago. But oh, how have the Senators improved? We're confident in them. They're very... Uh, I think a dedicated group of players as far as the game, and I think they're good players. I also think that they're not mature as they need to be, but I think they're growing. Chapman says the Senator's schedule didn't favor them being 11-1 at this point. But when asked why the fast start? I think Coach John Bricken in that uh, double overtime uh, win against uh, Lee last uh, night, you know, he said two years ago, you know, they were losing those. And this year they're winning them. He doesn't know why and neither do I, but we do know that we love the game, and we're glad that we're a part of it. Dave Cody, WSFA TV Sports. We're 0 and 6 against them in uh, six games, and I know that they're uh, a much improved team over a year ago. And how do you feel about your ball club right now? Well, I feel like I thought we would feel when we started the year. You know, we uh, we're confident in them. They're very. Uh, I think a dedicated group of players as far as the game, and I think they're good players. I also think that they're not mature as they need to be, but I think they're growing, and I think the young players that had the opportunity to play last year as starters and, and, uh, and also uh, in the league uh, that we play in, it's awfully tough. I think they matured a lot, and I think this year, because of last year and because of the addition of other players that we brought in, I think that we're a a much improved team, a much deeper team, and I think because of that and that enthusiasm, I think that, you know, we're right now 11-1, and one, even though our schedule did not uh, really uh, favor us being 11-1. and one.
house it was to see Auburn play Kentucky in their bright new orange uniforms, but it was Kentucky doing most of the playing, using their seven-footers, Sam Bowie and Melvin Turpin, in tandem much of the time. The fourth-ranked Cats ruled the boards and took the ball to the hoop with relative ease, especially in the first half. Bowie was virtually unstoppable on the alley-oop play, while the Cats were making uh, every free throw they shot until there were only three and a half minutes left and the game had long been decided. The one bright spot for Auburn was the long-range accuracy of Byron Henson. Sophomore guard was the only hot shooter in orange, scoring 20 points all from outside. Kentucky was led by Cowan with 17, Big Sam Bowie with 15. This is Bill Snow reporting from Auburn. One fifty-four. Ralph Williams has been a police dispatcher for 14 years. On an average night, he's responsible for about 38 police units, which cruise Montgomery streets. With us, when the telephone rings, there's somebody needing help, and I can help them get that help. What type of work did Ralph do before becoming a dispatcher? Well, I was. Uh, a terminal manager, an operations manager which in, in different cities. And in our job, while well, we had to dispatch trucks, pick up and deliver all over the city, that wherever, whatever city we might be in. And the last job that I had in trucking was here in Montgomery. And uh, so dispatching pickup trucks, pick up freight or dispatching police cars to uh, make a call now both have the same idea, is to get the people you need where you need them, the quickest. During his 15-year tenure, he's noticed a lot of changes in the police department. More women and blacks have been hired, and there's been a big change in equipment. The radio equipment is so far above the old equipment that it is just no comparison. And uh, the amount of equipment, the cars, I guess you'd say the cars are about the same, but the amount of equipment the rate and the communications equipment is so much better. A police dispatcher has a lot of power as well as responsibility, and a sense Ralph has been the eyes and ears of those policemen on the street. When I hear the call, the motor goes down, I'm, I'm on the radio, and I hear that call, I'm down, uh, or if somebody else calls in, we got a motor down, or you got a uh, policeman involved in, a, in an accident, first thing we ask is anyone hurt and when there's someone hurt well, then uh, there's nothing to do except get everything you can there uh, that you need and do it in a hurry because this ties in with the other question you would ask me uh, why I'm retiring and well I'm 65 years old and uh, these people are most of them are about my grandchildren's age so I'm beginning to look at them like my grandchildren, and uh, I just don't want to get hurt. I don't want them to get hurt. And uh, it's a good life for me. It's something that I like to do. Ralph to says he doesn't that. mind the pressure because he doesn't take the job home with him. He says he'll miss his job and the closeness he shared with the people in the department, but says he'll come back from time to time to visit and maybe even work the radio one more time. Cassandra Taylor, WSFA TV News. During the past several weeks, the Montgomery County Commission has been deliberating the merits of adding January 15th as a holiday, honoring the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday. After some heated debate, they decided to recognize the date at least this year. But Montgomery County State Senator Bishop Barron says all of their action is null and void because the county can only observe those holidays the state recognizes. The 1971 law is of local application and applies for Montgomery County alone. Barron cites the law in a letter to the Montgomery County Attorney and to the individual commissioners. Barron says he isn't taking a position on the county's desire to add to the holidays, but felt it important to remind the county commission of its limitations in this area. I think that the county commission wants to observe the law, and I have pointed out to them, I think, what the law is, and I think in no uncertain terms what the law is. But to be on the safe side, Barron says he's asking the attorney general to issue an opinion on the matter. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA TV News.
was we found that uh, many uh, convicted felons uh, from the state courts have been issued these passes. Uh, they can only be issued these passes by the uh, uh, State Board of Corrections. But they've been issued passes by the county people um, before. Well, they had been, and uh, we're hopefully going to see that that stopped. And quite frankly, I don't want the State Board of Corrections issuing any passes. When a prisoner goes to jail, that's where he belongs. Uh, I never uh, in my life thought that a person who's convicted of a felon, felony should be able to get a furlough and go home on the weekend. Sloan says the present Civil Defense Office in the basement of the State Administrative Building would be totally useless in a nuclear attack and not very effective during a natural disaster. He says the office, which currently serves as Emergency Command Center, doesn't even have an adequate emergency power system. The gasoline-powered generator emits deadly carbon monoxide fumes. So he's asking the legislature for a capital outlay of $300,000. The money would be matched with federal funds to build a command center five miles from the Capitol on Federal Drive. The center would protect key state officials and coordinate action during a nuclear attack, but it would also be used for daily civil defense activities. Sloan is also asking the state for more than $300,000 in his operating budget. That's compared to an average of about 11000 for each of the past six years. Sloan says the money is vital to bring Alabama's emergency preparedness up to the level of other states. Lisa Nielsen, WSFA TV News. Speaking for all segments of Auburn University, President Hanley Funderburg says Auburn is operating within all state and federal laws. AUM Chancellor Jim Williams says AUM has a non-discriminatory admissions policy and a sizable amount of minorities in the student body. Alabama State University officials say that a tri-institution merger between ASU, AUM, and Troy State University at Montgomery would have helped solve the course duplication problems. AUM officials say they won't comment on that statement until they fully read the report. I think you'll see more cooperation among all institutions, but uh, a complete and total merger, I think that really remains to be seen. The report says duplication in business and English courses occur in the Montgomery area universities. There are obviously, obviously are some programs which are necessary to have an institution. So we, we certainly have made no uh, attempt to duplicate purposely any programs that any other institution in the area might be offering. Troy State University President Ralph Adams was unavailable for comment on the report. Tuskegee Institute President Luther Foster says the big demand for the same courses at both Auburn and Tuskegee doesn't necessarily indicate duplication. Jane Matheson, WSFA TV News. This is where the New Traumatic Weight Loss Clinic used to be located, but they closed up months ago, depriving members of services already paid for. The president, E.T. Strickland, skipped town. He's in Texas now. But Attorney General Charles Graddock is not alone in his desire to prosecute Strickland. Texas, Georgia, and Florida are also investigating him. Graddock says he's charging New Traumatic with theft by deception, but he's not sure he'll win his case since no one has ever been able to shut down a spa before. He says if the appellate courts agree, then his office will move ahead with the other cases. The various suits involve about 24,000 people and up to a million dollars. Graddock says the spas all operated in about the same way. Solicit money, not pay their bills, take all the profit, put it in a local bank, move it into other banks outside the state of Alabama, close the doors and leave all the contracts unserviced. Other cities where Graddock has filed suit against spas include Mobile, Birmingham, Gadsden, Florence, and Summerton. He says besides breaking the contracts, the spas also failed to pay federal and state income taxes. Nutramedic, by the way, is being sued by Nutrisystems here in Montgomery because they say Nutramedic President E.T. Strickland stole the name and concept from Nutrisystem. Gina Gregory, WSFA TV News. There is a good possibility you'll be driving an electric car in the year 2000, and you may heat your home totally with solar energy, according to experts addressing the REA members. These are only two of the possible solutions to the energy needs of the 21st century. Dr. Ernest Stuhlinger of the University of Alabama at Huntsville told members that electric cars will be used for 90 to 95 percent of our driving in the 21st century, and that conventional vehicles will be used only for long trips. And he says trains will be utilized more in carrying freight long distances 
because with some modifications, they'll be more fuel efficient and economical than trucks. Auburn University President Dr. Hanley Funderburg told the members that the utilization of wood and coal as fuels will be most important along with biomass conversion, which is a process of making alcohol out of crops like corn and sorghum. The biggest change of the future is the size of new homes, according to Ken Mitchell of the Home Builders Association of Alabama. The average size of a house in the state of Alabama is somewhere around 1,600 square feet. This is going to drop that back down to, we feel like, somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,000 square feet in the years to come. The area meeting continues on Friday with Governor Fob James and Senator Howell Heffern addressing the group. Dan Black, WSFA TV News. Dr. Rodney Doran, speaking to Montgomery's Exchange Club, says the greatest number of newborn casualties will be in the rural areas of the state where some babies are born at home. Dr. Doran, using slides in his presentation, notes proper maternity care, medical attention, immunization, and diet by expectant mothers could prevent many infant deaths. Doran says only recently the infant mortality rate in Alabama was 25 in every 1,000 births. But now, because of neonatal medicine, or care for the newborn in distress, the figure is reduced more than 40%. Doran says since the regional neonatal intensive care unit opened in 1976 at Baptist Medical Center, 1,000 babies have been referred to the unit. It serves 20 counties and has meant a savings of several hundred thousand dollars to the state by bringing ills in check before the possibility of institutional care in later life. George Mitchell, WSFA TV News. McIntyre is not your average junior high basketball team. Oh, they line up five guys just like everybody else, but that's where the similarities end. For starters, the Hornets average 108 points every time they take the court. So one-sided have McIntyre's games been this year that no opponent has come within 25 points of them. McIntyre ran up 133 points in a win over Tuskegee, but the Hornets' highest outputs have come against city foes. McIntyre defeated Bellingrath 141 to 67 earlier this season, and last Tuesday the Hornets massacred Capitol Heights 144 to 44. Coach Leonard Hooks is the man behind this team. Hooks took McIntyre to a state championship two years ago. He says this year's team is different. It's better. I think it's better that they are quicker. They have more individual talent, and uh, they have, I think, a little more peripheral vision. Hooks insists there are no junior high giants on his team. For the record, the starting center today was Ken Crenshaw. He stands at 6'2". His backup, Andre Bruce, is 6'3 half. 6'1", Antha Green and Greg Payne at 6'1 half are the forwards. 5'9", Jeffrey McGee and Clifford Wright, 5'11", they're the two guards. In a game where it seems only the tall survive, well, McIntyre doesn't do too bad for such short guys. From the McIntyre Community Center, Dave Cody, WSFA TV Sports.